Thank you very Good. much. Good. Right. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to make this comparison is that towards the end of the 19th century, there was a widespread view in this country that we were being overtaken by a number of our competitors, notably the US and Germany, and they were doing things so much better than we were. There was also a view expressed that their methods of governing themselves in some respects were better, and the introduction of old age pensions in Germany was cited as an example of this. It seemed useful to make this comparison uh, explicitly in an area that I knew something about, uh, the production of maps. And that was uh, the, the formal justification for the talk. Uh, the informal justification was that I'd come across a source that uh, made it possible to look at a, a, a lot more specimens of the series I'm going to describe. And I was finding things out about them and thought it was, might be worth sharing them. My talk really only covers the period up to 1918 uh, because the relative positions of the UK and Germany were so different after that date. And also because John Cruikshank has written so much about the, the post-1918 period in uh, his Sheet Lines articles in sheet lines 72 and 73, I believe. So what is the structure of the talk going to be? I need to say something about the history of the, uh, the series. I'm not going to start at the beginning, though that might seem logical, because it's tidier to start after things had settled down in the 1890s. I'll then go forward to the end of the century and the beginning of the 20th century when, as in England, you start getting lots of different editions being produced, which complicates matters. And having done that, I shall then go back to the very start of the series uh, in 1878, which in, in, I say start in 1878, it incorporated older material, so the story actually has to go back quite a bit before that. I also want to cover a few, a couple of practical areas. One of them is how to date the, the fairly numerous trimmed copies uh, one encounters, copies trimmed normally to the outer margin. Um, and I want to say something about how what one sees on the map relates to what there was on the ground. I'll then round things off with what I've called the bottom line but I'm not going to stick absolutely to that order. Uh, there are logical reasons for departing from it here and there. So let us start then with the 1890s. Um, we're dealing with the Charta des, den, des Deutschen Reiches, which is a bit of a mouthful. So I I'm going to call it KDR. A uh, series of 675 sheets, at one to 100,000, uh, the sheet lines being uh, graticule based. The, the series covered all the states that made up the, uh, the new empire of Germany and also the new territories of Alsace and Lorraine, um, which, the, um, which had been acquired after the Franco-Prussian War. So let's start with Berlin as an example. Here you will see we have a sheet that blue on it. That was normal for this period. Um, the blue has been applied by hand, somewhat akin to uh, Ordnance Survey six inch practice at the time. You also have a sort of slate gray down here. The other application of hand color was to mark administrative boundaries, the, the basic unit being the Kreis. Whereas the Ordnance Survey uh, spread administrative names across the sheet, 
sometimes taking up quite a lot of space, the, the German practice was to give each Kreis a number or letter and put it in an oval. So you have 194 up uh, in the Tiergarten and 198A down at the bottom. Uh, in some ways, that's a bit more of a problem because those ovals, uh, in here at least, are opaque. You can't see what's going on underneath them. Whereas the Ordnance Survey did try to make it clear uh, what was happening underneath their administrative names. The, the railways are shown by a fairly prominent diced colour, but they don't have earthworks. And stations can be a bit basic. Uh, down in the, uh, the bottom right, you have here and here a couple of major Berlin termini. And stations you might describe as having been a bit botched. Here's London on the new series by way of comparison. Uh, the new series, of course, had the advantage of a, a somewhat larger scale, so could, could easily be a bit clearer. Um, here again, actually, the major London termini look a bit botched. Uh, the, the treatment of Euston with the line coming in seemingly at an angle like that to the northern end is not terribly satisfactory. But in any case, comparing these sheets in a uh, capital city is a bit unfair because they weren't designed primarily for that. They were designed primarily for uh, a more rural area. And so let's have a look at KDR in such a rural area. And I'll put a light on so that you can see me. Um, you will see that relief is shown by hachures only. There are no contours. And for that matter, the hachures themselves are a bit basic. The, there are spot heights, though not very many of them. I mean, there aren't any spot heights on this extract, for example. Where the surveyors did put a lot of effort in, was showing what was going on at the bottom of river valleys. So if you look alongside the, uh, the river here, you will see we have a little double dot symbol, which indicates meadow. There are also uh, horizontal lines making, indicating that it is wet meadow. Whether this means managed water meadow in the English sense, or whether it's just med meadow that was naturally uh, exceedingly boggy in winter, I'm afraid I don't know. In contrast, if you look above Ugrim, uh, alongside the stream, you have ordinary meadow um, with, without the wet sign. You've got drainage ditches intersecting the, uh, the wet meadow uh, there nowhere on this extract but elsewhere you will find marsh symbol a lot of emphasis goes into these river valleys probably uh, to give some guidance to uh, military forces as to how easy it would to be cr to, uh, to cross them off road the other importance of river valleys <coughs> is uh, or at least wet river valleys is in terms of the management of 18th century engagements. To what extent this was really true of the 19th century, I, I don't know. Um, but if you look at the, the sort of engagements that uh, Frederick the Great uh, was fighting, then uh, you, the standard arrangement then was that you, you lined up your forces in a straightish line facing the enemy who also lined up his forces. You have something in reserve, of course, um, but the weak point of that line was always the ends. 
could you be outflanked by the enemy and in particular by the enemy cavalry and anchoring uh, your line of battle on a, a wet river valley was quite a good way of making sure that you couldn't be outflanked by, by cavalry. Anyway, that, oh, before I move on to talking about new additions, um, a few words about dimensions. I've compared there uh, the, the new series against uh, KDR in terms of the paper dimension, uh, also the, the size of the printing plate, because you can see the print, the plate impression, and uh, the map within neat lines. Um, as you will see, uh, in all respects, KDR is quite a bit smaller, uh, particularly as I uh, happened to measure a, a set, uh, a sheet from Alsace, which being further south, uh, has rather smaller east-west dimensions than the more northerly sheets, a consequence of having a graticule-based system of sheet lines. So I said I'd move on to the end of the century and the early uh, 20th century, where you start getting multiple variants coming in. And the most important of these was in 1899, the introduction of what subsequently at least would be termed the B edition, the previous one having been the A edition. Uh, what you, in, in some ways, it's, it's similar to, to what the OS was doing. The OS was taking its line work and transferring some of it to different plates, which could then be printed in different colours, uh, always doing this lithographically. The, in the case of KDR, we actually have new line work being created. So if you look at the River Oda, for example, there, you will see that it's shown as blue, just as it would have been on the A edition. But on the A edition, it would have been hand colored blue. Uh, what you have here, the blue is, uh, is in the form of water lining uh, from the blue printing plate. So that is new line work. The hashers were moved to a, the, the br a brown plate and that also added contours at 50 meter intervals. It's not exactly a, a generous contour interval. And consequently, very often you don't see much in the way of contours. But if you look down, if you look down northwest of Briskov, you will just about be able to make out a contour go around the 50 meter spot height there. Extending that comparison of dimensions, uh, what is interesting here is that you don't see, or at least on the specimens I've looked at, you do not see the impression of the printing plate. It's almost as though the paper size is the same as the plate size. And this may have something to do with the, uh, the way in which registration was maintained. It's really quite unusual to have a, a, a color printed map with all the colors printed from copper, which is what this is. You then get yet more variants coming in. Um, the Kreis carton uh, were sheets which were expanded as necessary uh, to cover the whole of a Kreis, uh, effectively a district in English administrative terminology. And I've included an example uh, on the, uh, the right hand side there, uh, showing a, an integral printed cover um, from the 1950s. This map carried on uh, really remarkably late. You also have Umgebungskarten, which were in effect district maps. I talked about the A edition and the B edition, I think you have to recognize something which I've been calling an A minus and a B plus. Some of the A edition sheets 
have water colored blue, but don't have administrative boundaries colored. Uh, whereas occasionally, you know, whereas the standard B edition doesn't have any standard, any hand coloring, you do find examples where um, you have administrative boundaries colored. And then certainly by 1918, you get what was later called the C edition, which was printed by transfer uh, to aluminium plates, aluminium rather than zinc in, for, for, for the German survey organization. It was really not very happy with the results it was obtaining uh, by this method. And in consequence, these sheets, at least the early ones, are marked, if I can find my pointer. Where's the pointer gone? Here we are. Um, in uh, this very prominent uh, warning at the top, um, uh, which I think is equivalent to lipo offset edition. And then before that, you get uh, the large sheet series introduced, which was later called the D edition, typically by combining four sheets uh, onto a single stone. And that you sometimes saw six sheets combined on, onto a stone. All these variant editions, except obviously A minus and B plus, um, were uh, printed lithographically. And that's one of the problems of the series. You have something that was designed uh, with quite fine line work, which is really best seen when printed from a copper plate and litho printing can be a challenge. I can't resist showing one of the, uh, the less frequently encountered editions. The Grenzschutzfecker edition effectively is the, uh, the Border Protection Force edition, uh, which you find, find for sheets straddling the German-Russian border. And what's interesting about this is that the, the Russian area uh, has very closely spaced contours. The contour interval is 2.13 meters. And if you're saying why on earth that, because it's the, uh, a, a Russian unit of length, which they used on their one to 21,000 maps uh, which were their basic scale, basic scale for survey, and which I presume to be the source for these. Though they do, they do, you do see contours on the, 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 the 42,000s as well, but they don't seem to be the same ones. That Russian material was actually used to compile a sort of eastward extension of the of KDR. Uh, called the, the Karte des Westlichen Russlands, which um, carries on a considerable distance to the east and also it goes rather further north. The system for that is changed to a column and row basis rather than um, running along in lines in the way in which the Ordnance Survey numbered its six inch sheets. The problem with doing that is that if you change the area covered, you've really got to renumber all your sheets, which is a real pain. So I can well understand that they decided column and row was a necessary uh, reform to their system. If you are looking at those, uh, that, those Russian areas, then you have to watch the, the railway symbols used. The standard symbol for railways on KDR uh, was that which on the Russian sheets is specifically single track. By about 1911, KDR was introducing a, cross, a line going across the white dicing uh, as a way of indicating multiple track railways. And what's interesting is that for the German sheet, these, this symbol is used, sorry, the, for, the, for the Russian area, um, this symbol is used for single track railways with a formation 
uh, constructed to allow the addition of a second track. That, of course, was extremely useful militarily if one wanted to upgrade one's ability to get troops to the front on mobilization uh, in a, you know, to do it very quickly. I have never seen that on any other map, as far as I'm aware, a special symbol for that. On then to the relationship between the, the map and what was there on the ground. In general, the KDR is, has very good marginalia for telling you what's going on. Um, it will have an Ausgenommen date, which is the date of survey, a Herausgegeben date, which is when it was published, published being a pretty similar in uh, you, 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 the way it's used to the Ordnance Survey. Um, Berichtigt means full revision in the Ordnance Survey sense, that is to say everything on the ground has been inspected, and then you get uh, Nachträger, which corresponds to selected revision. Uh, in its full form, it means that features from a particular list have all been checked and updated where necessary. So you're going to say what uh, features. And I might add, you also have uh, Einzelne Nachträger, which are when they only did some of them. So what gets included in Nachträger? Uh, roads, definitely, and you have a, a process that is described as chaussee nachträger, uh, certainly in the 1850s. Railways get updated, and it's interesting that if you find a sheet with an Einzelner nachträger date in, say, 1910, 1911, 1908, and you look to see what prompted that activity, you will very often find a light railway on the sheet. And one of the beauties of Google is you can investigate the history of these uh, light railways surprisingly easily. And it so often happens that the railway in question was opened in the same year that the, the revision was done. Most of these light railways were state funded and it looks as though there was a uh, a, a sort of semi-automatic uh, mechanism whereby the the survey organization was prompted to update its maps at the same time new settlements qualify to appear uh, under nachträger you don't see many of them but i came across an example of a new seaside resort on the, uh, the Baltic coast, a very modest one, nothing like Skegness, for example. Uh, a, a new, there was a road with a, a row of villas, a small hotel, and in due course, it prompted the opening of a railway station. Uh, and that was considered sufficiently important to uh, appear uh, on this basis. Extension of urban areas also qualifies, and by this I mean the, the solidly built up areas shown by diagonal hatching in city centres. So Berlin is the, the obvious example of this. Um, scattered suburban development didn't qualify as far as I can see. Metrication of heights is something that may get picked up in Nachträger and also changes to place names, many of which arose as a result of the, the, the movement to modernize spelling. So you have quite a number of place names which in the mid 19th century were customarily spelt with an initial C, uh, of which the most famous is Köln, and that got changed to a K. Uh, so that happens quite a lot. And the dropping of an H after a T uh, can also generate these uh, changes. Must have been an irritating amount of re redrawing of lettering on a uh, copper plate merely to 
satisfy local authorities who decided they wanted to update their place name. But it happened. It's worth noting that the, the place where the, the date of survey is given is down at the, the bottom left. I explained uh, when describing the Berlin how local authority areas, districts, were um, indicated by way of a number in an oval or letter. And here you have an example uh, with Kreis Memel. Uh, down, down at the bottom left, you will also always see what these numbers stand for. And because German administrative uh, structures were convenient, conveniently nested, unlike Scottish parishes, uh, it can also show you which Regierungsbezirk uh, they fell into, and of course, which state. So Memel is within Prussia, and then the other area there is Russia. Uh, and the, the survey information, naturally enough, relates to Prussia. Uh, they don't actually say what the date of the, the Russian survey is. So that's all I intend to say about how the map uh, relates to ground truth. I want now to go back to the early history and what happened in 1878 and around then. 1878 was when it was decided that this series should be, should be produced as a, a standardized 100K covering the whole area, and it needed to be done fairly quickly. What made the task reasonably manageable was that Prussia already covered more than half that area, and there was an existing Prussian 100K series. So extending that series was the obvious way to go. If you look at numbers, uh, there were in existence 319 uh, Prussian 100K sheets. There were another 72 uh, Prussian sheets on the same sheet lines, but covering the Rhineland, and these were at a scale of one to 80,000 because of the, the French influence there. There were another 130 sheets which fell within other states of the empire which had their own survey organization. The rule adopted was that whoever had the largest share, the largest area within a rectangle, was responsible for producing that sheet. And so um, Württemberg and Bavaria, for example, um, got significant numbers to produce. And then you had 154 sheets needed to fill the gap, basically, between the Rhineland and the, the main uh, eastern part of Prussia, along with Alsace and Lorraine. And those covered states like the, the new lander of um, Hamburg, uh, for example, also uh, states like Hanover, uh, swallowed up by Prussia in 1866. And of course, it included the new territories of Alsace and Lorraine. If you look at publication dates, you can see what priorities were adopted, and they were the sensible ones. Alsace and Lorraine came at the top because the French were uh, somewhat dischuffed about having lost this territory and were threatening military action. Uh, then you have the business of filling the gap. Then came the updating of the 80Ks in the West, and finally uh, updating those Eastern sheets that had been taken over from the old Prussian series. I should say that uh, one might argue that the Austrian frontier at least needed uh, to fit somewhere into that priority scheme, but I haven't listed it because essentially it was uh, it fell outside the scheme in that it was part of Bavaria, their responsibility. And I have to say, almost everything I shall be talking about 
uh, focuses on the, uh, the Prussian sheets of this series. I haven't tried to uh, distinguish the subtle variations that you get with the sheets produced by other states. So looking at one of the sheets that seems to have lost out quite badly, uh, this is rather a complex slide, I have to admit, but uh, you can work it out. Posen, the modern, the modern Poznan. You see here in the state in which it uh, was being presented on the, the map of, when was that produced? Not sure, but that's the, that, that was the current sheet in 1880. As it happens, a new survey had already been carried out by then. I don't have the precise date, but I know it was done before 1877. And you see that new survey at the 25K scale on the left. And you will see how very much change has taken place uh, in the, the city. You've got a new railway here. And the old railway, rather curiously, has been rerouted so that it now goes out that along there, whereas on the old map, it's shown going there. You might think that ought to have been a very high priority for updating KDR, but as far as I can see, uh, there was not a new publication of KDR, which this would have required, until 1891. Uh, a rather longer gap between uh, resurvey and publication than you would normally find. And I can only assume that's because the, the, the at least the drawing resources uh, allocated to all this work were simply not adequate. You, some of you may have noticed these rather interesting white spaces here. I did actually come across a map uh, a version of the 25k actually, which shows what was going on there. Um, Posen had one of the most extensive systems of uh, fortification uh, of any city in Prussia. And a lot of that survives. It probably now has the finest example of surviving Prussian mid 19th century fortifications. But that's a diversion. Carrying on with this business of having to incorporate older material, the, the Prussian 100K had had a new style introduced in 1863. Previously, it had been lithographed. From 1863, it was engraved. And it's a very much clearer style corresponding to everything I have shown you up to, up to now. So Prussian maps from the period 1863 to 78 look exactly like the KDRA edition, except that they lack the series title. They don't have a series title at all. And the numbering is different because it's numbering for a 319 sheet series rather than for a 675 sheet series. So it's rather akin to the incorporation uh, of the northern old series sheets into the, the new series in England. Sheet one pro provides a legend. There was something of a tradition with German mapping of putting your legend or your fancy title if you only did it on one sheet, on sheet one of a series. And sheet one conveniently has quite a bit of C, uh, although uh, one, it rather looks as though the designers of the map would have, would have liked to have had a bit more, more C. They use up all the C they possibly can for their legend. It seems rather convenient that sheet number one just happened to come up for uh, publication at exactly the time when they changed the, uh, the, the style. I wonder whether the, there was a degree of um, fudging arrangement to make sure that did actually come about. 
If you go back before 1863, then, as I said, you're looking at lithograph sheets. They don't have any form of diced border. They just have a plain neat line. And what really stands out is the treatment of the main roads, more so than the railways. And then you have this rather odd treatment of what I've called garden areas, but it's more general than that. Let me show you. Here we have one of the, the earlier sheets, which has now been incorporated. So it has the new title, Carta des Deutschen Reiches, uh, probably put there by lithographic transfer. What you have here is one of the, the main roads or chaussee, uh, a thick continuous line in the center, thin lines either side, and then this alternating tree symbol. I'm assuming that's what it is nominally at least. Um, as I say, very distinctive, at least distinctive as, in, in comparison to other KDR sheets. There was quite a tradition of that sort of depiction of main roads. Railways, well, would you say that was diced or not? I'm not sure whether to describe it as diced with a very thin black section or uh, simply to say that it had uh, occasional cross sleepers, but they were quite thick cross sleepers. When I talk about garden areas, if you look at the depiction of villages, so look at uh, Dolgelin, for example, um, you have a focus on the street frontage. The surveyor isn't really very interested in what's going on behind that frontage. And then he surveys the, the boundary of the enclosed area around the village, the gardens, the paddocks, etc. And everything between that outer boundary and the buildings just gets shaded uh, in this with diagonal hatching like that. Um, it's, it's not ideal. It was a, to some extent, a quick and dirty method of doing the job. These sheets also have physical features whose names are written in a German cursive hand. You have an example up here, for example. If you can read that, then your ability to read cursive German is a lot better than mine. If you go back to, the, to, to before the 1840s, and some of this material did indeed survive to become uh, part of the, the KDR series. Then you see a couple of differences. You still have main roads done in this same sort of manner, but you have rather more careful treatment of the area between the buildings themselves in a village and uh, the outer boundary of the enclosed area. You know, with intermediate fences, etc. And it's shown by a rather more, uh, rather by finer dotting rather than by those, um, by, by diagonal hatching. Another great merit, as far as I'm concerned, uh, of uh, these earlier sheets is that the, uh, the German cursive hand uh, used for physical features is a lot more legible. Now, I said I'd say something on the practical side of uh, how you can date trimmed copies. There are reasons for this that I'll come to later on. The easiest thing to do, of course, is to say whether it's pre-1863 or post-1863. Uh, I've explained uh, over the last couple of slides um, just how you recognize the, the pre-1863 ones. So I don't need to say a lot more about that, although I will say something about the very earliest sheets I have encountered, which have very sparse marginalia, unlike what I was saying about survey date, publication date, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have nothing except scale and the, the names of the adjoining sheets. 
And the scale for these earliest sheets is the router, which corresponds to the English rod pole or perch and was pretty obsolescent by the 1820s even, I would have said. Treatment of adjoining sheets, for some reason, just giving the name of the sheet was not considered sufficiently clear. It was thought necessary to uh, explain what the name was. And so you have here, you have Jung Sectio uh, Tierstiegel, along with the number. You have the same thing, north, west, and east, except that for west and east, the number is not given. I suppose they took the view that people were perfectly capable of, of adding or subtracting one from the sheet number they were looking at. Let's get on to the post 1863 sheets, which in some ways it's more important uh, and it becomes a bit messier. The first critical date I can offer is that there was a decision to metricate uh, the heights and depths in 1876. Certainly on new sheets, um, whether it's updated on all Nachträge or what, I don't know. And then the following year, you have uh, railway destinations added for the first time, normally in the margin. Railways run from left to right, or if in doubt, from bottom to top. So this particular one uh, goes, where's my cursor gone? Um, von uh, Schneidermühl uh, nach Dierschau. Initially, at least, they weren't too fussy about where they put the railway destination. And so on that particular sheet, you have a railway um, which uh, has its destination uh, engraved on top of a lot of detail. They decided fairly rapidly that was not a good idea at all. And in due course, even on that sheet, uh, the, the complication of um, uh, the lettering on top of the uh, all that got moved. Actually, I see we have got earthworks on that railway. Eighteen eighty was certainly when a lot of the old sheets were um, given the new title and the new sheet numbers. It would be logical for that to, to have been done as a a mass job, but one sometimes encounters it's it's normally explained as new edition, and one sometimes encounters new editions of a slightly later date. So what else got included in a new edition? I'm afraid I don't know what practice was at this time. And then another very useful date, 1902 to three, they start explaining uh, how the lines or what the lines of longitude are based on. And as had been the practice in Germany for a very long time, they're based on ferro. For those of you who are not familiar with ferro, it was the extreme western point of uh, the, the mainland of Europe. The thinking being that if you made that zero, then uh, all your longitudes were east. So you couldn't have silly errors creeping in where someone mistook a west longitude for an east longitude. The only trouble with this was that no one actually knew where Ferro was. I mean, they knew approximately, but you don't have a network of triangulation extending from Germany across France through Spain uh, down to Ferro. And so the, the German Ferro was not the same as the Austrian Ferro, which was not the same as the Russian Ferro. So what they did at this date, in effect, was to change to doing things with regard to Greenwich. Uh, the, when, when that statement gets introduced at the same time, a, little, a note goes into the marginalia explaining the conversion between Ferro and Greenwich. 
but they still have to keep ferro on the sheets themselves for the time being because they are graticule based with nice round numbers, but they're only round numbers if you're working in ferro. And finally, I've already mentioned the introduction of that extra uh, mark on the dicing to indicate multiple track railways. I said finally, there's one other feature which is not in the margins, but which often survives, and that's the scale bar. As I explained earlier, you start off with a scale in Rüten, which is also explained in terms of Schritte, these being paces. That scale was no longer being introduced on new maps by the mid-1840s, but that doesn't, didn't mean it was necessary to change it when revising a map, at least as late as the 1850s. By that date, the standard uh, arrangement for a scale is a single scale uh, marking 10,000 Schritte, which by definition were deemed to be one mile. Um, German miles are big. From 1873, they went to a triple scale. And the triple scale from in 18, 1873 uh, gave you at the top 10,000 Schritte, uh, which was deemed to be one old Prussian mile and explained as that. You had a second scale, which gave a, which was for a geographical mile, which is not usually explained, but was defined to be one fifteenth of a degree at the equator. And then you had a third scale in metric units for people who wanted to use these newfangled units. That only seems to have applied in 1873, and they rapidly change uh, effectively by putting the metric units up at the top, where you have eight kilometers deemed to be the same as 10,000 Schritte, uh, a second scale for the one geographical mile, and a third scale for the old Prussian mile. And then about, well, in the 1890s, it gets simplified, at least on new publications, to a, a double scale, uh, two-part scale, where you have 10 kilometer and 10,000 Schritte at the top, and a second scale with the geographical mile. And now the old Prussian pre-metric unit has dropped out altogether. So I promised to uh, try and pull this together by some form of comparison. And that needs to be done in two parts, really, the, the military side and the civil side. So far as the military side is concerned, if we start off by looking at what was happening in the, in the UK, I think one can say that in 1872, the military were not really very interested in the one inch map. But by 1892, the search had started for what was termed the ideal military map. And out of that emerged the, the revised new series in color of which you have a specimen there, I have to say a very attractive map. Then came the Boer War and the perception that uh, a sheet covering 18 miles by 12 really wasn't big enough. And what, the, what was needed was a Bartholomew's half inch, depending on who was in post. Not everyone seems to have agreed. But after a lot of uh, toing and froing, which Richard Oliver has described admirably in his essay for the new small scales book, uh, a satisfactory outcome was reached. And if you look at the, the evident utility of the Belgian equivalent, uh, GSGS 2364, it looks as though that was quite a satisfactory outcome. Turning to Germany, there is no doubt that uh, KDR still had a very important role to play. Part of the evidence for this is 
the amount of effort that went into drawing something like 500 sheets of its eastward continuation. To complicate matters, you also have a 300k uh, developing, which I would describe at least as a road map rather than a topographical map. Policy was for a very tight distribution of the 100k series on mobilization, uh, insects, and uh, John Cruikshank has explained this in his Sheetlines uh, 77 article. Uh, so effectively, you have two maps being used, uh, one of which there weren't very many, which could inform the tactical decisions, and another which was probably very useful for more general tasks like uh, planning convoys, uh, etc. Here you have a specimen of the 300k uh, in the form in which you have fortified areas uh, marked by that um, close, uh, that heavy overprint with forts uh, in solid colour there. As you can see, it's, it's not really a topographical map. And I can't help observing that one of the the great German coups in the mapping uh, area was somehow getting a set of those Russian 1 to 21 thousands, or possibly 42 thousands, but I think they're 21 thousands they, they got, uh, which enabled them to draw that massive set. Um, and then, of course, fairly rapidly on both fronts, trench warfare developed. And they didn't want these maps at all. What they wanted was artillery maps. But having mentioned that uh, coup, I couldn't resist, even if it's going down a little bit down a rabbit hole, uh, showing you this comparison between KDR sheet 78. And this is a specimen with a library accession date of 1893. Uh, straddling the uh, German-Russian border, and the uh, relevant sheet of the Karte des Westen Russlands uh, with a printing date of 1897. And I have to say, I do believe that printing date. Uh, one of the reasons for going through all this business about uh, longitudes relative to ferro, etc., is that it helps one check that a map really is of the sort of date it uh, uh, appears to be, or it says it is. And you will see that the Russian area is completely new. But in both cases, you've got um, Russian mapping, which is used for the Russian area. And the evidence for that is that the hills do not join up. Um, German hills just push up against the border, flat ground on the, the, the Russian side, or here you, you, you've, you've got Russian hills which you know, don't match the German ones. But the black detail has been changed uh, between those two sheets, as well as the, in, in, as well as the addition of all these uh, uh, brown contours. Now you've got this stream wending its way up through this rather boggy area. No sign of it on the new sheet. Anyway, a bit that's a bit of a rabbit hole. I want to want to finish the military comparison by putting two sheets from mobilization sets effectively uh, side by side. So on the left you have uh, the British view of what a military map should look like. And on the right, you have the German view. And aesthetically, I don't think there's much doubt as to which is superior. But this is not a beauty contest. What is at issue is which product is better for informing tactical decisions. I've tried to be fair in the comparison. So on the left, we have the sort of country an invading force would need to traverse 
in moving inland. Um, and that road running north through Carrington, where's my pointer gone? Through New Bolingbroke up to Reevesby uh, is exactly the sort of road they might, uh, an invading force might uh, have to use. I freely accept that this particular road running north from Boston is unlikely to have seen an invasion force advancing along it, but it's the sort of road that would have been involved, and I happen to know it. What does the half-inch map tell either side that might affect tactics? Not very much, I would say except that someone in the van of the advancing force may need to explain to the crossing keeper at New Bolingbroke that he will not be allowed to shut the crossing gates to allow the 1128 to pass. Is there anything the map ought to tell us? Yes. The country either side until you reach Reevesby Bridge is cut up with drainage ditches. Thus, movement is more or less confined to the road. Whilst infantry can wade ditches, and there are a certain number of farm bridges, it's not something they want to do. Thus, quite a small opposing force can create a blockage that will take time to clear. And if the invading column bunches up on an open section of the road, sitting up on an embankment, it is horribly exposed to a prepared attack from the flanks. One machine gun on each side, suitably dug in, could cause massive casualties. In contrast, the German map, and I've tried to show a similar road running north from Emden, uh, maps the drainage ditches in considerable detail. The cynic might observe that drainage ditches were not a problem in South Africa. Had there been copiers just north of Boston, the OS Half-Inch almost certainly would have outperformed the German product. Unfortunately, British forces were condemned to fight on low ground during the First World War, especially after the High Command decided that Passchendaele was a good place to launch an offensive. The less cynical might observe that the application I have postulated was intended to be catered for by the map of East Anglia at two and a half inches to the mile, and I've been unfair in postulating a German landing so far north. If one accepts this view, one reaches the interesting conclusion that both the British and the German armies had recognised that they needed maps at two scales, a map for tactical decisions in manoeuvre warfare and a smaller scale map. Whereas the Germans stuck with their tactical map and added a small scale companion, we switched to a smaller scale for the tactical map and then realised that something better was needed uh, where it was possible to anticipate the ground that would be fought over. But the British pair of maps was at a much larger scale than the German pair arose because the Germans thought in terms of massive armies fighting a continental war, whereas we were focused on colonial engagements and now, in this case, uh, local responses to a relatively small amphibious landing force. Conveniently, our tactical map at two and a half inches to the mile was at the right scale to serve as an artillery map into which it morphed without even a change of GSGS number. So that's the military comparison. What about the civil side? Well, as you will know, uh, for the, so far as the OS is concerned, there were a lot of policy changes on what the map ought to look like, but eventually the lithographed third edition large sheet series in colour emerged. It was a popular map, it enjoyed good sales, and it was suitable for large print runs. In contrast, KDR enjoyed massive stability of content right through to uh, 1918. Apart from the, uh, the creation of the B edition, which used drawing effort for style alone, all the other changes I've described were really quite minor and tended only to affect things that were being added. Although, 
you did have the introduction, rather perversely perhaps, of a new three color engraved one to 200,000. That particular series, it's odd. Um, one might regard it perhaps as a parallel to the Ordnance Survey small sheet half inch. That the surveying organization has been told what the requirement is and their reaction is what you really need is this. And it wasn't what was needed. Another parallel or another way of viewing it is that the introduction of the French deep 1900 uh, caused other countries, mapping organizations, to feel that they were being left behind and that they had to do something clever to show that uh, they were as technically capable. But overall, the problem with uh, the German survey production for civil purposes was that it was geared to producing relatively small numbers of relatively expensive maps produced by produced from copper. There was no real thinking of how one could produce an attractive uh, map in the sort of quantities that would meet mass demand should mass demand ever arise. And the consequence was that uh, after 1918, with vastly reduced budgets, the A and the B edition more or less died by the wayside, and you had that very nasty C edition, which was all that they were able to produce. So I think on the civil side, the uh, Ordnance Survey certainly comes out as very much better. A couple of statements of acknowledgement. First of all, uh, the, 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 the site, a, a Polish site uh, has been created, which has a lot of maps of an enormous numbers of series, but including KDR, including the cut, uh, Des Westlich in Russland, etc. Um, and I do recommend reading uh, John Cruikshank's article in Sheet Line 77, uh, because notwithstanding the title, there is a lot in it on KDR and German mapping before World War I. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. And uh, that's a veritable romp through your Anglo-German comparison. At last, I know my difference between my Schritter and my Rutter. Good! <laughs> I shall add, add Ruta to my uh, fascinating scales of, uh, of measurement. While people think of uh, questions to throw at you on a more serious note, I, I think since we're bound to have one or two railway fans on board, I, I was riveted by, uh, fascinated indeed, by the uh, Unterbau uh, symbology where you have room for the second track mm. on a single line railway. Is it unique? I, I'm going to ask Michiel to join in on this one because he knows mm -hmm. much more than uh, um, uh, most I know. But I mean, are there any, is that available in uh, uh, any other countries mapping? And are there any other um, highly unusual uh, railway symbols that we, we haven't yet discussed, I wonder? Well, the, the idea of an, an extra an room for an space for an extra track was not not always military. It could always also be an economic choice for the railway company if they expected uh, more, uh, 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 more uh, customers. Oh, it could generally, yes. But in, in Western Russia, I don't think they were expecting more customers. <laughs> I other don't other think so, really. Uh, that's true. Um, I, I saw in the Posen uh, map that the double, the double track uh, symbol was two stripes. And on the old Posen uh, map, it was a single track line with single stripes. And I have found an Austrian map 
which has the checkered line with an extra stripe. But ah, what, what I have, to, what I didn't perhaps make entirely clear was that the more modern map of Posen was of the 25 scale, K, scale, which uses different symbols for railways than KDR. Mm -hmm. Oh, if a K is so you, you get multiple negative. track uh, lines shown on the one to 25,000 long before you get them shown on the one to 100,000. Yes, uh, another thing, uh, interestingly, I have uh, I have found this uh, the 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 Eisenbahn Karte, which is on the on the uh, ach, on the side of the Landkartenverein, and it still has the same uh, graphical uh, conventions, like the same uh, the same way uh, rivers have. Uh, have have names in backward slanted italics, ah. and it's a. I think the reason is that the the, the same organization printed them, and that is the, the German military. Right. Um, another fine point about the the way the uh, water is symbolized. You have rivers with the streamlines, but. You could see on your ex on your uh, uh, specimen that there was also a canal, and a canal has just horizontal stripes. Ah, yes, yes. So that you can see the difference between flowing water and standing water. That's a good point. And uh, aside about the the Prussian mile, I have noticed in in Denmark that, and and in Sweden that. The the the, uh, the the long mile was typical in Nordic invention. In De in Denmark, you can still find milestones alongside the main roads, which are measured in Danish miles, which is ah. an enormous amount of alen, <laughs> which is which is the same as the Dutch strange old old uh, measure L, and an L was your el your elbow length. It's about 30, uh, 40 centimeters. And, oh no, uh, I'm, I'm falling in a rabbit hole, just like you now. And, uh, I think, uh, I think Cochran Cochran I, wants to come I in. I think that was, uh, uh, oh, one thing I, I told you, uh, the double track symbol could also mean double single track to avoid a, a junction out, out mm. on, oh, the, yes. on the, on yes. the road. I think um, that's it. Thank you, Michiel. Um, uh, isn't it amazing? Just be I, John's uh, busting to come in here. John Crookshank. Yeah. Can I can I just think say what I think of it? What an enormous measure the old Prussian mile was. Seven and a half kilometers. Not very. Yeah. Happy. Uh, yeah. The the these huge long miles. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, Denmark. But Sweden uh, also has exactly, well, it may not be exactly the same, but there are those long mile measurements um, go back a long way on Swedish maps. Uh, the, um, there is, uh, a, the German military encountered exactly the problem of working out what all these different long miles were, because some of their maps had been done, as Rob said, um you know old measurements and there's a very detailed complex article uh in shortly before the second war in the mitteilung des reichsamtes für landesaufnahme uh fundamentally which was the german military scratching their heads and trying to work out exactly what all these different standards amounted to uh because particularly um, as the rearmament began in 1938 onwards, um, the, they were actively planning to be extending German maps, not just into the Western part of Russia, uh, but into the whole of Western Europe. And so they were actively looking at French mapping and how to bring that up to German standards uh, and were disappointed in that because 
between the wars, French mapping had been starved of investment. And as a result, much of France was still mapped at the old, uh, with the old uh, type 1889 or carte de la major, the French is rubbish. Um, so that they, they were antique surveys in France, the, the type 1900 and I think type 1922 uh, covered really quite limited areas of the country. Yes. Uh, the, uh, I should say that Rob has presented all sorts of good stuff on these maps. It was, uh, I'm afraid I missed part of the talk because my internet connection kept collapsing. Mm. Um, the, he's looked at the 19th century German mapping uh, in far more detail than I had gone into. Um, but one of the things that I was able to use for the article that Rob cited um, is that uh, the, the Germans produced uh, a superb book detailing all the various scales they had produced, scales of maps they had produced, um, and their peculiarities. And uh, during the interwar years, not unlike the... Um, uh, the Harley Guide to Ordnance Survey maps. It's a sort. It's, it's a 1930s equivalent, and that, although it's written in German, um, it actually includes all sorts of uh, gems to explain why things were had become the way they were. One of the things the Germans were shackled by, and robbers uh, touched on this in several places, was that. It was very, when, they, when the KDR was designed or was established, it was uh, accepted that the perfect map had to be engraved on copper. Uh, that, as the Ordnance Survey discovered, that has all sorts of limitations because although you can revise a copper plate by polishing it out and re-engraving it and uh, such like, um, it's nonetheless difficult or well, it, it is damaging to print from it to production printing. And so although the, uh, the A series and so forth were able to produce copper plate impressions from the map, progressively they ceased to do that because the plates were getting worn and were having to be touched up and uh, some, you know, Richard, I'm sure, um, will appreciate that the Ordnance Survey encountered massive problems with plate wear and how to how to cope with that problem. The so the shift towards uh, transferring the lithographic stones began quite very early on because you can production print from flat lithographic stones uh, in much greater numbers than you can from a copper plate. And then the transfers onto aluminium foil plates uh, for rotary printing, that really only got going with the large numbers required during the First World War. Um, uh, and that sort of, if you like, changed the technology. But after the war, and this is obviously outside the scope of Rob's talk, Effectively, they had to go back to square one because the limitations imposed by Versailles were such that uh, a lot of their lithographic printing, uh, or at least printing from metal lithography, um, had to be abandoned. A lot of the lithographic stones, particularly of those, those areas that were Alsace and Lorraine and were given back had to be given back to France. The stones had to be given back to France as well. So they lost a lot of capability there. And then uh, the Geddes Acts might have cut back the Ordnance Survey's expenditure in the 20s, uh, but that was nothing like the cutbacks that happened with the civilianized Landesaufnahme after the First World War in Germany. Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, I think Rob's uh, looked at all sorts of things that I didn't look at, and some very interesting stuff has come out. Thank you.
in response to Jerry's remark about uh, uh, railway symbols, one of the complications you get in, uh, in Germany, and uh, John may be able to say something more about this because uh, uh, it's, it's a complication that you really only see after the First World War. Um, the, the initial main lines uh, count, were built to one set of regulations. By the 1880s, it was apparent that it would be useful to have uh, branch lines more lightly built to less demanding regulations to make them economically viable. And those were called Nebenbahnen. And then uh, about 1900, uh, you start getting uh, the, uh, the light railways being added to even uh, laxer regulations and uh, much more limited weights and speeds, uh, which were Kleinbahnen. And you, you then have the problem that, that, that Kleinbahnen incorporated or embraced also, I believe, uh, street tramways. And the, the symbol you get uh, on the, uh, for, for, for the, the lower category of railway um, on the, uh, the post-war German maps is, if I remember it correctly, um, uh, Neben Bernische uh, Kleinbahnen. No, uh, light railways with the characteristics of branch lines. <laughs> I, I'm afraid uh, off the top of my head, I can't answer the question. Um, the, I re, uh, the, um, you're ahead of me on that one. Oh, one other point I was going to, you made, you made the, the origin of the um, of Ferro. Yes. Um, the problem of standardizing that was where Ferro is. Mm. Because Ferro is in the Canary Islands. Ah, sorry, not the mainland. And right. it's the island uh, uh, now known as El Hierro, yes. which is the westernmost of the Canary Islands. And they're some distance off Africa, and the triangulating from the Canary Islands between each other is difficult enough, but triangulating from there to mainland Spain, um, it's too far around the curve of the earth. And so, the Spanish triangulation was awful anyway, wasn't it? I, 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 all of the above. So the, uh, the position of Ferro um, was subject to a whole stack of potential and actual errors, because it's an island halfway out in the Atlantic, um, uh, which th explains a lot. Mm. I think the, the only way Pharaoh could be uh, ascertained was by, uh, by, naval, by naval navigation, by star, exactly. uh, star sightings. Yes, absolutely. And interestingly, there are there are some definitions of Faro still uh, floating around on the internet, and I've I, out of my head, the standard one is that Faro is seventeen degrees twenty minutes out west, but when you look at another side, it's seventeen minutes to, uh, thirty four and some. Which one is the which one is the real one? Oh, <laughs> so oh, can't, sorry, can't, can't, stupid question. There isn't the real Faro. No. 1720 well, was the, 17, the, the, the one. 1720 which, is the, the, the usual value. Right. It's the one that, yeah. that, that Germany standardized on, I believe. Yes. Uh, not when I described it in 1902 to 3, but in the um, uh, 1920s. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Wasn't if, this you a, to, if you, if sorry, you go but, to the island of El Hierro itself, they will point you at a lighthouse at the southern end in an active volca volcanic zone, which is said to be the zero point for Ferro. Now, uh -huh. the idea of having um, a zero point for uh, in an area subject to volcanic change um, <laughs> is um, itself a problem. <laughs> that wouldn't be a problem because there is the a location there is a of lighthouse. the lighthouse was uncertain anyway by, 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 by naval navigation. Oh. Uh, yeah, um, the the list of problems with the origin of Ferro um, go is a long one. <laughs> is a long one. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> talking of rabbit holes, <laughs> uh, this the the earlier conversation of, of all these different scales um, and international comparisons reminds me of some early German atlases, and I'm desperately trying to remember which one did the best. But some of them would have at least six different international scale bars on the bottom of their mapping. Um, from all or all over Europe. Um, I'm sorry, I can't be more specific on that. I can see I can... above above uh, Chris Hickley, who's momentarily disappeared. <laughs> uh, oh, there you are. There you are, Chris. You got your you got your hand up. I see you're displaying Richard Oliver's new book. I'm going to ask him to. Uh, uh, I, I talk. thought I'd go in for a bit of subliminal advertising while I was on the job. Talk about that. Yes, and uh, yours, yours, and uh, um... I should say. The Go question ahead. I wanted to ask, which I suspect is something I should know, but don't, is, Rob, you described the uh, extension of the German mapping eastwards. Mm -hmm. But in the 1418 war, they were fighting in Belgium and France. And was there any extension of the same series westwards, or were they just relying on reproduction of Belgian and, and French mapping? Uh, I think John Cruikshank is better placed to answer that than I am. Um, I, I, I certainly don't know anything about Belgium. The, um, what they did in the early part of the war was to, to reproduce uh, French and Belgian mapping. Um, particularly the French mapping was reproduced um, just uh, by Helios Incography and uh, reprinted in the sheets that it was in. Um, there was nothing better you could do with it. Uh, the Belgian mapping, I think they produced fairly early on that because it was better quality mapping to start with, they were able to redraw that to German specs um, and they printed some very large sheets. Uh, what both sides discovered on the Western Front during the First World War is that the sort of scales we're talking about of one to 100,000 um, are precious little use for trench warfare. And so both sides started scrambling to produce much larger scale maps suitable for position warfare. Uh, now there's a paper in the cartographic journal written by, um, uh, my mind's just gone a complete Peter blank. Shefford? Somebody's, hmm? Peter Shefford? Peter Shefford, yes. Um, uh, the, uh, just after the millennium, I think, I forget the exact year, but there is a, there is a paper in the cartographic journal uh, looking at the German large scale trench mapping, which is well worth a read. Um, he put a, I think that was based on his, uh, his PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a huge amount um, of knowledge there, um, much of which is sort of understated, but it's the, the bibliography at the end of that is uh, a magnificent multilingual bibliography. Uh, so worth a look. Thanks very much indeed. I'll chase this up. Um, the, the other thing to say about the Eastern Front is that there is a lot of mapping done both by the Germans and by the Russians and the Romanians and the Bulgarians um, for that war most of which is undescribed, but there's some, the, the, particularly the German side of that is a complex story in itself that Peter Chassaud has, uh, I'm sure is aware of, but has barely touched. Thank you very much. And, uh, are there any more questions for Rob or indeed John or anyone else? If not, I'm going to ask uh, Richard if you would, uh, You've raised your hand, I see. Yes, would, I, I, would, I, I, would you like to tell us a bit about your forthcoming talk as well next Monday? Um, yeah, I'll if I can just um, ask or uh, make a couple of points. It's actually just a couple of points. One is the um, familiar British one inch third edition large sheet series in colour. This was actually put, although produced at War Office behest, although admittedly it was very fortunate from the point of view of civil sales and the war office um, certainly did the ordinance side by favor in that respect. 
The other is the use of aluminium plates. The only use of aluminium plates I've heard of in this country was by George Phillip and son around 1911 or so. And I, and I only know that because of evidence which was obtained from Phillip in the course of investigate of the um, Ilkeston Committee investigation, investigating um, Ordnance Survey staff matters in 1910-1911, uh, um, where um, evidence was obtained from various commercial firms, including Philip. Uh, whether other firms were using aluminium plates and found them to be unsatisfactory or what, I really don't know. This is um, something which is rather under-researched in British map printing history. It rather looks as though um, John has got something to say about this. Uh, just a, a brief comment. The zincography or zinc printing was seldom used in Central Europe simply because of the shortage of zinc. Um, and therefore, aluminium was the best they had available. Now, they, they did have problems with the quality of printing, but had to put a lot of effort into making short or establishing techniques for getting decent quality images off aluminium plates, because fundamentally that's what they had to work with. And the same applied uh, for the Austrians and for the Russians. They were all having to use aluminium plates uh, because uh, importing zinc was uh, not realistic. Whatever zinc there was was going into other armaments. Mm. I think, in fact, the Soviets themselves, I mean, the, all those uh, Soviet maps that uh, John Davis and everybody's been looking at. Um, most of those were printed from rotary offset off aluminium plates. Same reason. Thank you, John. Richard, you're going to give us a talk next Monday. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Before before we move on, let me uh, not as not uh, uh, um, forget to thank uh, Rob Wheeler enormously for this talk this evening and um, yeah, yeah. a very very welcome addition to the program and thank you very much to everyone else especially john crookshank for all the contributions you've made this evening it's fascinating fascinating i want to learn i want to know more but chris higley has reminded me by this blatant advertising behind his face on screen of this wonderful new book by uh, <laughs> by him indeed and richard and roger hellier of course richard you're going to talk to us about that volume next um, month yes um just to rub it into you all <laughs> um yes i'm going to talk about it um and um show some um slides of um mapping which is included in it um quite a bit of this will have been seen before in my um talks on the half inch and quarter inch maps um, which were given um, I think in uh, rather early in this series of Zoom talks a couple of years ago but there will be um, some more material which I hope um, you, um, won't have been seen some of which will be um, reject material for illustrations which we had scans made for but uh, in the event wasn't used so uh, there should be something slightly different there and I hope there'll be something of interest and I have had some um, a few bits of comment and feedback already on the um, text, so I hope that it uh, simply won't be a rerun of uh, what I've subjected um, my uh, long-suffering audiences to um, before. <laughs> Which reminds me, I will need to assemble things by the end of this week, and if you would like a duplicate copy of the slides, they might not reach you until um, well into Saturday. <laughs> Uh, that you're talking to me there? Yes. You'd like me to operate the slides? Uh, no, I'm very happy to operate the slides. It's up to you entirely. But no, uh, I, uh, best if I operate the slides and we can um, perhaps switch between um, slides and uh, looking at me, me, me talking. Excellent, excellent. But uh, it's always a good ruse to let me have the slides in advance if I'm yes. hosting, um, just in case a, a link goes wrong or something. Yeah. Uh, but I'd be delighted to look at them. Thank you very much, Richard. We look forward to seeing you then at 7.30 as well on the evening of the 17th, which is next Monday. Next Monday. We have a glut of superb speakers at the moment. What do we do? What do we do? Uh, can I also remind folks uh, that uh, are available to be in London that on...
the 22nd, and on a date prior to that, which I'm not involved with, uh, John King is leading a walk um, with free maps at the end. So you have to stay to the end of his walk. Very cunning move, that. But around uh, Nine Elms and the enormous redevelopment of the area in and around Battersea Power Station on the South West Bank in London. Um, and that is Saturday the 22nd. The, uh, send me an email, chairman at charlescloesociety.org, if you'd like to come to that, or indeed need the codes for Richard talk, Richard's talk. But it's in uh, the bulletin, the uh, Charles Close email bulletin. So uh, refer to that if you need to come. And being in Scotland is no excuse. <laughs> Listen, thank you very much, everybody. It's been a fascinating discussion all round, and um, I wish you good weather. Thank you and good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Goeie avond. Goeie avond. <laughs>